Hello, my dear friends. <laughs> How is it going? I'm Ari Thurger, and today I'm here to talk about Thor's daughter. Thruder is her name. Uh, this video is dedicated to a dear friend of mine, one of the few that lately has been giving me good advice and insight, as well as keeping me company in my darkest hours these past few months. This video is for you, Mama Crow. <laughs> well then, Truth be told, uh, there isn't much we can say about Thruder, aside from being Thor's daughter, but perhaps some elements can be linked to particular aspects of Old Norse magic and European folklore concerning magical women. So let's get right away straight to the point. My dear friends, if you please. Well then, uh, we only know about the existence of Thor's daughter, Thruder, from uh, Cannings. Figures of speech. Uh, Thruder uh, is also the base word in woman cannings. Uh, her name means power or strength, denoting both a powerful woman, but also Thruder, just as her brother Magni, is a personification of Thor's strength and power. There are some terms that also express this idea of power, such as Thrudyelmir, uh, denoting a powerful shout or scream, which is a giant who is the six-headed son of Orgelmir. Uh, there's, of course, uh, Thrudheimer and Thrudvanger. Uh, the former is the, the home of power or power realm, the name given to Thor's residence in the poem Grimnismol. The latter, Thrudvanger, is the field of power. Likewise, it is Thor's residence, according to Snorre Sturluson. In Thrudervanger uh, lies Thor's hole Bilskirnir. All these names are late mythological embellishments. So, Thrudr, Thor's daughter, we understand it to be a powerful woman, a name mostly used in poems as a canning, and uh, little else is concrete about this entity. However, <laughs> there are some important uh, aspects that point to a possible lost myth in relation to Thrudr and uh, her meaning and possible presence as a feminine spirit that may have played some role in the belief systems involving the cult of the Tisir, the feminine spirits to whom some sort of cultic behavior was held, right? Ancestral feminine entities related to fate. Thrudr is said to be a Valkyrie in skaldic poetry. Snorre will elaborate more on this, of course, uh, saying she is, the, she is Thor's daughter, so it is uncertain whether it is the same person or not. Nevertheless, there's a Valkyrie named Thruder, and uh, being the daughter of a god or is rather curious and not common at all, as far as the, the surviving Old Norse myths go, of course. And um, this time, this time, it seems Snorre may have specifically linked this Valkyrie to Thor, due to a lost myth, of which we have just a glimpse of it. So it is quite possible that Thor had indeed a Valkyrie as a daughter, a, 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 a daughter that was a Valkyrie. We shall get to it in a moment. As I said, her name mostly appears in a canning, as, as a canning, uh, including in skaldic poetry, mostly. Her name was also quite common as the second of, uh, of, uh, of women's personal names. It was quite common for people to have personal names as the junction of part of the father's name or joining with particular mythological names of deities. Uh, there are no concrete indications that Thruder may have been a goddess, mind you, but she might have had some considerable importance given the fact that women would bear her name as part of their personal names. Name giving of this type was often to invoke specific attributes or powers of the original person or entity that bore the name, passing on unto the child those specific attributes. Taking into consideration what I've said on the previous video about the um, Old Norse goddesses, <laughs> we do know that the goddesses mostly played a religious role in the belief systems of the rural areas, mostly in farming communities and among women's societies. It is also important to bear in mind that the celebration of Disaplot, a sacrifice and uh, some form of cultic behavior towards the Disir, the ancestral feminine spirits, was held in the late Iron Age and medieval Scandinavia 
as such, given this focus on feminine spirits and women with Thruth's name as part of their personal name, she may have indeed played some religious role in more rural areas, bearing the name of one of the important feminine spirits that may have been called upon in some specific situation, right? The Disir are often linked to fate, destiny, death and fertility. Through there is a Valkyrie, and in part such entities, the Valkyries, Valkyriur, not only are connected to death, but also to fate, usually um, talking about fate in battle, right? The, the fate of, of both those who are to die, but also the, the very fate of a battle. I've elaborated on this um, uh, in an old video uh, concerning the Val Valkyries, the Valkyriur, so if you have the time, please check that one. Suffice it to say that Valkyries with the fate of battle and those who are to die in them, in, in, in such battles. The literary sources present Valkyries as quite bloodthirsty beings and the battle magic they weave is quite gruesome. So Thruder may have been a name that would bear a considerable religious focus towards the Disir, and since she is both a Valkyrie, so related to death and fate, and also the daughter of Thor, Thor being a god mostly linked to fertility, Thrudr may in fact have had the role of fate over fertility, the fertility of the soils after a period of death and darkness, winter time. As such, she would bring forth life related to the harvest. This sablot, the celebration, the sacrifice to the Disir, or in honor of the female spirits or deities called Disir, uh, had as the main purpose to enhance the coming harvest, a fruitful and successful harvest. In some accounts, the celebration of this sablut appears to have been held during winter nights, right? Or the, the, the winter night, or at the vernal equinox. And it was a celebration performed by women. Well, of course, uh, at the same time, as the Inglinga saga suggests, it was royalty, mostly the king, or, or in the, at least for the case of Sweden, who performed the rites in the celebration of this sablut at the temple of Uppsala. Uh, it was a celebration of some importance, we get that, and uh, no doubt it would have been celebrated by both the elite, holding this celebration to the subjects in a major gathering at Uppsala, but also held in the rural areas, and in that context the performances would have been held by the women of the farming communities. Speaking of a lost myth, uh, Snorri links Thruder to Thor, being his daughter, but so did the skulls. Earlier poems already have as a canning to Thor, precisely father of Thruder. The famous 9th century poet Bragi tells us of the giant Rungnir, with whom Thor has a terrible fight, a great duel, one of the most famous duels, if not the most famous and important in Old Norse myths. In this myth, one of the cannings for this giant is Thrud's abductor, Sjolfr Hrudar. There's no other myth telling us anything about this, <laughs> at least not a myth that has survived into our days. But Bragi, the poet, spoke of a shield hanging on the Great Hall, which contained carved several mythological scenes, many of which did not survive into our days. But the object he speaks of existed and depicted mythological events. Bragi is describing a shield in existence more or less a century before the conversion to Christianity. Thrud's abductor suggests a now lost myth precisely of the abduction of Thrud by the giant Rungnir, and this would give a whole other dimension to the very myth of Thor's fight with the giant. Quite possibly by kidnapping Thrud, Thor's daughter, the giant woke Thor's fury, and this gives a more concrete reason of, for the duel to take place. Remember that this was a scene carved on a shield in the 9th century, 9th century. Now, interestingly enough, there's another poem, Orfismal, the words of the old wise, and this Attic lay was probably written much later in the 12th century, and it presents Thor, the god Thor, outwitting a dwarf named Alvis, the old wise. According to this source, Alvis, the dwarf, requests the hand of Thor's daughter in marriage, but is outwitted by Thor 
and so he had no luck and was turned into stone in the sunlight. This is a very late poem, probably written in the 12th century, as I've said, but it is interesting to see a very wise dwarf, Vergar, in this case. This rarely appears in the myths, because dwarfs are not usually regarded as smart beings in old Norse mythology, but they were in folklore. As here said many times before, such mythological accounts mostly depict the reality of the elites and were indeed to extol and to please the ruling patriarchal and military elite. The belief systems outside these social strata were barely recorded, if recorded at all. But if we take into account that folk traditional beliefs deal much more with entities of the world, spirits of the land, we understand why dwarves, Vergar, were regarded as wise within the folklore, but not within the stories composed for the elites, for the ruling elites. Spirits of the land wise in the lore of the land, and as such they could give great advice for the benefit of the human farming communities. So this late poem, Alvismol, sorry, Alvismol, incorporates folk beliefs, or at the very least gives space to folk belief or to, to folk oral tradition. In addition, there seems to be some similarities with the 9th century account of Thor's duel with Rungnir and the lost myth of Thrud's abduction. The case of, 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 of the abduction of women to be forced into marriage was a traditional method of courtship, which during the Scandinavian late Iron Age takes a more ceremonial or rather um, staging performance of this act, recalling the actual primordial action of kidnapping actual women from other groups to procreate, to avoid sexual intercourse with the, um, the same women of the group, avoiding incest uh, as to prevent the birth of children with some physical and psychological and or psychological anomalies recurrent in such cases of incest. As such, a much earlier poem about Thor's duel with Rungnir because of the, the lost myth of the abduction of Thor's doctor would make a lot more sense still in the 9th century Scandinavia, just before the conversion to Christianity. However, after the conversion, several traditional motifs and behavioral patterns changed. In the 12th century, under a Christian society, the poem Alvi Small reflects that change of behaviors within Nordic society, taking away the element of abduction of women and forced into marriage, of course, and taking away the more violent behaviors of duels, which eventually were outlawed. In Alfie Small, instead of a brute giant who kidnaps Thor's daughter, we have a very wise Dwergar who requests the hand of Thor's daughter in marriage. The duel here is of words, a duel of wits, which would make a lot more sense in an Icelandic society deeply focused on the power of the written and spoken word and on the composition of poetry. Remember, the case of Snorri Sturluson's prose work is a didactic composition for professional poets, so the battle of wits between Thor and Alvis makes a lot more sense within this Christian social context and within the context of medieval Icelandic poetry and oral tradition. The myth of Thrud's abduction may have been lost forever, unfortunately, but in the later poem of Alfie Small, there seems to have been or, uh, retained some aspects of it in the oral tradition, namely within folkloric and poetic material. There was no need for a reenactment of a kidnapping of a woman as a traditional motif before the marriage, the, the marriage ceremony at this point in history, in Icelandic history. As such, in this poem, the dwarf, the Dvergar, Alvis, has been promised instead the hand of Thor's doctor in marriage. And he arrives to celebrate the wedding. And then Thor demands, uh, as a condition for the wedding, that Alvis must answer a few questions. And they spend so much time in this that the sun comes up and Alvis turns into stone. Quite the Hobbit story <laughs> with the trolls. Well, I think it is safe to say, given the, the period and the content of this account, that Alvi Small, this poem, is a later poetically reworked version of earlier, earlier skaldic poetry and some lost myths. And thus, sadly, 
we have lost important information concerning through herself. But this might explain why she must have been important within the cult of the Disir in farming communities, where folkloric material may have been somewhat preserved and later on give way to some poetic materials. Besides, um, it is interesting to see Thor's daughter being promised to a uh, Dvergar. Uh, the dwarves were land spirits, uh, spirit entities of the soil, and through their being the daughter of the god of fertility would join up with a spirit whose power also reflects the very fertility of the soils or the land itself. But the fertility of the soils is Thor's word, and through their being the personification of Thor's power, cannot possibly be joined with a minor entity of fertility. Thus, Thor arranges that such a land spirit ends up being turned into stone and the union isn't consummated and Thor continues to prevail over the fertility of the soils and no other. An interesting aspect of the name Thruder is that in medieval times the name became associated with witch, German Thrud and Drud, a witch, a sorceress, nightmare. It is also associated with Old Norse Troa and Gothic Thrudan, uh, to tread, to walk, to step on or put your feet into something. Thrud would therefore have its origins in nightmares, and that's one aspect we should definitely talk about. In fact, it is worth mentioning three important feminine spir spirits or entities related to nightmares, dreaming, death, and fate. They are the Mara, the Valkyrie, and the Hemingia. Let's briefly take these into consideration, uh, given the meaning through the later on developed as a witch and as a feminine entity that steps into people's dreams, causing nightmares. If you remember my first video about, the, about Wendish, ancient religion and folklore, you remember that I've already talked about the Mora of Western Slavic folklore. The Mora is, uh, is a feminine spirit that is said to enter a person. Uh, that person is possessed by such a spirit or soul. It could be the very spirit of a witch or a sorceress uh, that is sent forth to enter a person's dreams and cause nightmares and ride that person, control that person. The Mora isn't just a feminine spirit of Slavic folklore, mind you. In Scandinavia, there was the Mara, precisely, and it is known by many other names. Here in Portugal, for instance, we have the Mora, or Mora, enchanted feminine spirits or sorceress women with great magical power. Throughout Europe, such feminine spirits are known by many names. Mora, Mara, Mora, Mare, Morina, Zmora, Morava, etc., etc. This is the origins of the word nightmare in the English language. The mare that comes at night <laughs> into people's dreams. The feminine spirit of a witch that rides people in their sleep and gives them nightmares, unpleasant dreams as she rides and controls them. In Wales, there's a spirit of death attested to in folklore known as Marion. All of these terms derive from the Indo-European root word morosh, death. This feminine entity gave a considerable contribution to the progressive development of the figure of the witch throughout Europe. In most European folk beliefs, such entities usually appear as someone's soul projected into dreams or as dead souls, returning souls. Sometimes this spirit is someone's double, or can be projected as an animal and goes into people's houses and into their dreams. But focusing on uh, Scandinavian context, there's the Mara, as I've said, of which I've spoken of on another video, doesn't matter now. Mara is the nightmare, a projection of a woman's soul. The Mara is the nightmare that writes people in their sleep. It is described in Old Norse sources as a threatening dream creature, sometimes a horse. It is the spirit form of an evil sorcerer or sorceress, and sometimes a supernatural entity of destruction that is sent upon an enemy. Then there's the Valkyrie, of which I have developed on another video or several other videos, so I'll just briefly sum up. 
The Valkyries, Valkyriur, are feminine beings directly connected to the gods and with Odin, the god Odin in particular. They act as the choosers of the slain in the battlefield and bring the valiant dead to Valhalla. The sources also describe them as beings of carnage, weaving the fate of those who are about to die in battle, as well as the fate of battle itself through battle magic. Spirits related to dream, death, the weaving of fate, and quite the nightmare sometimes. Feminine spirits that were also praised in the cult of the Tisir. And then there's the Hemingia, plural Hemingur. I've developed on them as well on another video. Hemingia is related to the Filgur, um, a type of projection of the human soul. The Filgia is the follower, the fetch, which develops later on into a type of witch's familiar spirit in animal form. These appear either in dreams or to those gifted with powers of second sight. So we have the concept of both dream and perceiving one's destiny at the same time. The Hemingia is similar to the Filgia and similarly connected with concepts of destiny. This is the personified luck of a person and represented as a spirit of good fortune, usually appearing as a spirit woman or as the sole projection of an ancestral woman, Tisir. So, taking into consideration that Thruder was a Valkyrie, and her name developed into the meaning of a witch, as well as a sorceress woman that steps into dreams, the very nightmare, and is the, the base word of the, or, or, for nightmare, the nightmare, <laughs> following the conceptions of Valkyries, the Mara and the Hemingur, we continue to see a pattern here of feminine beings related to death and destiny and appearing in dreams. So Thruder may have had another important aspect or aspects within the farming communities and their belief systems and folklore as a spirit entity that appears in dreams to present important aspects of life that in turn would contribute in the development of a better life for such communities and for the, the people to whom Thrudr would appear or manifest itself in dreams. Being Thor's daughter, she may actually have had a particular space within the folklore and belief systems of the farming communities in the rural areas. There is indeed a connection here with the concept of ancestral feminine spirits and souls of powerful women and the whole panorama of activities and effects such beings had in the animistic perception of pre-Christian peoples. Well then, that's it. <laughs> I do hope you have enjoyed this video. May it be useful in some way. And of course, a special thanks to my dear friend Mama Crow and to all of my other friends. And a special thanks to my patrons who make it possible for me to continue doing these videos and this type of work. Thank you so much. <laughs> and of course, obviously, a special thanks to all of you, my dear friends, who continue to watch my stuff. <laughs> Thank you so much for watching. Now, see you on the next video. And as always, talk for Thanks for today. Obrigado por hoje. Until we meet again, my dear friends.